Well, last week's great opening scene was very philosophical, but today's, this week's opening scene is all about setting up the lead character as a total badass. So today we're talking about the fantastic opening scene of Once Upon a Time in the West. We're back for season two of the Impactful Writing Podcast with seven new shows based on great movie openings. And today we're on our second show, which is focused on the opening scene of Sergio Leone's Once Upon a Time in the West. I'm Jay Shear, and since Caleb Monroe is traveling today, I have the privilege of talking to a great guest host. I'm really excited about it. I'll introduce him in a moment. The Impactful Writing Podcast is produced by the Reclamation Society and is part of the Story Geeks Network and the Art of Storytelling YouTube channel. If you missed last week's show on the great opening scene of Alien Covenant, you can watch that on YouTube, or it is also on the Story Geeks podcast feed. You can listen to it over there. Um, and then this show will be available on the Story Geeks podcast starting next Monday on July 26th. So thanks for listening in. Um, let's welcome in today's guest. I'm, I'm excited about this because the enthusiasm that this guest has, not only for this film, but also for a lot of the same things that I really love, is off the charts, and uh, he makes me smile a lot. So let me just join me in welcome, welcoming to today's show, screenwriter Leo Partable. Leo, welcome to the show. <laughs> I'm so glad to be on this. This is great. I'm excited. Yeah, it's awesome. It's really fun to have you on. I don't think, have you ever done a Story Geeks podcast yet? No, not at all. Oh, I'd love to. I want it's to another so one. So long. It's taken so <laughs> long. Um, one of the things I really love about talking to you, Leo, is that you and I, like, if we were to go through all of our favorite stuff, it's like all very, very similar. You right. And have, you and I have very similar tastes. And so it's really fun to geek out with you about this kind of stuff. Before we get into that, can you give people a little bit of background about yourself? Uh, about some of the writing projects that you worked on that you're working on now, like just just a just a basic history, a brief history of of Leo Partable. Yeah, um, just a capsule summary. I'm a, a, a screenwriter. I'm a filmmaker, writer, director. I write and draw comic books. Um, I've worked in animation. Um, uh, I've I've taught uh, screenwriting courses and. Um, Gosh, I I don't know. I'm blanking right now. Yeah, well, I know, I know, I'm, a, but... I'm a singer songwriter, and I put it all. To, I guess the, the 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 best way to do it is to encompass everything as a um. I, I just I want to let my films to do the talking, mm -hmm. and and my my mm -hmm. my work do the talking. So, um, yeah, I I just there's a lot to talk about, but I'm I'm actually I'm so zoned in about talking about how about this film, like I want to jump into it, but it's also <laughs> like. But also, I guess I can refer to my own project. So, because I'd be, if I just say it now, then it'd be like, okay, um, I would be retreading the same thing. So, I want to maybe it'd be better to just uh, um, discover just it as it. we yeah, talk. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Well, I will mm -hmm. tell you that one of the things that, um, that Leo and I consistently talk about over the years, I'm sure we'll bring it up in today's conversation as well, is um, how much we both love what Zack Snyder was doing with the DCEU. And um, we're both big fans of that. So I'm sure that will come up. Uh, but um, Leo and I always have a really fun time talking together. So now before we dive into our discussion, I want to set up the scene uh, for Once Upon a Time in the West, um, this opening scene. Because if you just haven't seen the movie in a long time and you're just joining us or if you are, even if you're a giant fan of it, it doesn't hurt to go back over what happens in this scene. So um, Once Upon a Time in the West is a Sergio, Sergio Leone film, which stars Charles Bronson, Henry Fonda, and Claudia Cardinal. I don't, I don't know how to pronounce her name. Do you know how to pronounce her name, Leo? Uh, I've heard it, uh, Claudia Cardinelli, uh, Cardinal, okay. Cardinal. Either way, it's just, I've heard different versions of it. I mean, she's what, Spanish-Italian? So I think... Uh, yeah, I think yeah. so. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so I'm Great doing actress. a bad job. Leo's doing a much better job. <laughs> But uh, fantastic cast. Um, this film is all about a gunslinger and a desperado who protects a widow from an assassin who's working for the railroad. Uh, it came out in 1968. And the opening scene has three gunslingers, all who look pretty like pretty badass outlaws, quite frankly. They mm -hmm. all show up at a train station. Each takes up a position at the train station. And they all await for the arrival of the train. The uh, constant turn of a squeaky windmill the train station telegraph machine, an obnoxious fly, and water dripping from a water tower all build the tension 
as those things all annoy these different guys that are waiting for the train to show up. Um, <laughs> and then when the train does arrive, Charles Bronson appears. And I want to get into a, the, that specific moment because that specific mm -hmm. moment is actually also really awesome. But Charles Bronson uh, appears and asks if these guys work for Frank. They say that they do. He sees behind them that there's just three horses and he asks where his horse is. And they say, I guess we're one short, to which he responds, you brought two too many. And then they all shoot each other. <laughs> and that is the opening scene of Once Upon a Time in the West. Um, and it is a fantastic opening scene. I love it. I just love it. So, Leo, you mentioned to me that you're a big fan of Sergio Leone um, films. And I am, too. Uh, which is one of the reasons that I picked this film uh, for this series and this opening scene. But mm -hmm. do you think that this is Sergio's best opening scene or would you have chosen a different opening scene from his catalog of films? Um, actually, I think this uh, to me is the best mainly because it, the, the film itself, it, I mean, it, uh, it sets, it lays the groundwork for, mm. for, uh, a new type of storytelling. And so mm. actually I shouldn't say that because I think Rio Bravo had, uh, it, it actually didn't have any uh, dialogue in the uh -huh. open in, in its scene as well too. But, but I just love those scenes because it, um, I used to be the type of person that, that, that I, I think I overwrote and, and uh, uh -huh. by that is that it was a lot of, of uh, exposition mm. and I thought quirky dialogue and everything else, that's the way to, to grab the audience and and mm. get the attention, and, and I think that's a that's a, actually a, one of the problems with a lot of films nowadays is because it's all about how do you entertain the person rather than how do I, I engage the per person artistically and then also reach into the deep in the heart, and mm. and that's a very difficult thing. And so what Leon d does is that, and, and by the way, the you know the screenplay is uh, co is. The story was written by uh, Bernardo Bertolucci, the great director, mm -hmm. and and of course, um, uh, uh, what, what's his name? The the um, Dario Argento, the mm. great the, you know uh, uh, horror, the horror master. So, I mean that I mean the fact that these three collaborated together on this film is just really amazing, right? Yeah. They spent a, they they were the, the the three of them were were I guess hold together an entire year. To do this so everyone thinks it's like oh i i'm so behind and people are, are all about speed but these guys were sitting down and they're watching films like they this film references a lot of other westerns it references the searchers uh mm -hmm. the comancheros it references all these different films uh i think shane is another one is another mm -hmm. film and so it was like all the best of westerns but then all of a sudden leon comes in and says hey listen let's let's it felt it was more a more accurate depiction because people don't seem to they like this aspirational uh, uh mono myth of the of the western hero mm. whereas in this film we've got this guy uh, charles bronson plays you know he's mexican right so right. um so this entire thing and and we see for the first time i think this is the first time that leon um uh, actually has um people uh, like i think i think uh native americans in the film because mm. pre previously, before the, the other three, you know, you know, they're Mexicans, and they're shot in, in in Italy. This one, actually, some of it was shot in the United States. Oh, I and didn't know that. Wow. Yeah, and so and so the other the other I think some of the other scenes were shot in Barcelona. I'm not sure. I have to check, check it again. I'm just I'm just off of the top of my head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I, I think I think, th but this 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 one is textbook how to introduce characters. If you, I saw, uh, uh, I think somebody took a deep dive into Raiders Lost Ark about the mm. exposition scene in, um, about the Ark of the Covenant, right? Remember the, oh, the, yeah. the government agents come in, talk yeah. to Indiana Jones, but it's how to make an engaging, you know, how to do exposition, but making it engaging and, and, and set up the mystery of everything. This one was, oh man, I mean, we don't, we don't talk enough about this. This is textbook, how to do a scene and introduction of characters, but visually. Yes. Right. And, but, yes. but it's also about the old West and about the loneliness and about the, the boredom. And then who are these characters and, and what the, all of a sudden the, the characters, it's, a, it's the bl blurring of the lines of like, who's the villain? Cause yeah. you don't know if these guys are the heroes of the villains, right? Right. Right, they're the archetypes. You've got Woody Strode, who's the black gunfighter. You've got Jay, um, 
uh, uh, what's his name? Um, Elam. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Is, is yeah, Jack right, Elam? right. Jack Elam. Yeah, yeah. yeah Jack yeah. Elam. And I don't remember the other guys. But but basically the three of them. And it's interesting because Sergio Leone wa originally wanted this to um, – he want. I think I, I read somewhere that it was supposed to. He wanted the three gunfighters mm. to to rep, to be there. <laughs> he was going to gun them all down. This is also before <laughs> he, you know Clint Eastwood was was offered the role of of um, of uh, uh, the original role, and um, I think uh, of Charles Bronson's role, right? Okay. And, yeah, and yeah. So so do that, but uh, I guess Eastwood turned it down, which I actually turned. I mean because. You know, I mean, Bronson de definitely looks, uh, you know, uh, looks similar. I mean, very similar to the ending of the, of the kid, the reveal, and, you know, Mexican also, um, which I'm wondering, I think Bronson is, I'm not sure I have to look in if, if, if he has, uh, uh, if, he, if he's part Mexican. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but, it, but it was just amazing. I mean, yeah. just an amazing cast. He changed everything around. He yeah. he he'd wanted to work with Henry Fonda for the longest time, and Henry Fonda. I mean, this was imagine you're coming in. Henry Fonda is the face next to John Wayne and Jimmy Stewart, and mm. and Gary Cooper, the face of the American West. Mm -hmm. And he's playing a villain in this film. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? Yep. Yep. He's and, got those and, steely blue eyes, but he is a bad dude. God, yeah, but him, <laughs> yeah. I was just like, I was like, there. I, I mean, the thing is that Leon made everybody so. He takes the 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 raggedness, the craggy, and makes it all beautiful. Yes. And so I'm looking at, and I'm watching. You know, you sit down. If you don't, if you're not paying attention, you're just going to dismiss this stuff and go. It, it's it's too slow. Blah blah blah. Yep. But I could. I just watched Henry Fonda and the subtlety that every single actor in the film, yeah, right. It did. They didn't dial it up and try to be all, you know. They weren't. They weren't doing these massive monologues about the West. They, <laughs> right. he nailed it in like a couple of lines here yeah. and there, and and, uh, and and so you you see this. The the it, it's remarkable. Just yep. the just the opening scene because first of all, it's the mystery. Yep. Second of all, exactly. it, the it, it begins in the train station, and that is that 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 is the linchpin of this entire plot. Mm. You just might think, okay, well, so it's, it's a it's a uh, it it's the the train station, and well, you know, we see that all the time. You're like, but no, but this is this is the heart. This is the heart of the American West. Yeah, and this is the heart of this story right here. Yeah, and and how he lays it, the setups for the later payoffs are all in the you know mostly in, in this opening scene right because yeah. with the exception of of um Car Claudia Cardinal's uh you know character everything else in there is just you know your you, you this opening scene it, it's in there and so yeah. you, but but imagine you're sitting there and you're used to the western conventions all the tropes and 19 you know but then you see, you know the the previous uh, the trilogy that he did. It, it you know it, it it just reached into 1960s America, right? The, oh, the rebelliousness, yeah. Yeah. and then this comes out, and I'm you know I, I'm sure people were like, okay, this is this is really ticking me off because it's pretty violent. Right. It's you know, but strangely enough, what's his name? Um, uh, I, I, the uh, director. Um, I'm just trying to remember uh, who directed the Wild Bunch, right? Um, oh yeah, I don't know who directed the Wild Bunch. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't know why I'm I'm blanking out on it, but but anyway, he actually did not like. He, uh, apparently, he didn't like Sergio Leone's, you know, take. Strangely enough, which I thought, you know, it's it's it's, it's so Sam, strange. Sam Peckinpah. Sam Peckinpah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he's one of my favorite directors, and and yeah, yeah. and yet I, I think I think it was also. The legend was, I guess, was due to the fact that Leon wanted him to direct one of his pictures, and um, Peck and Paw said no, and then uh, so there's kind of a bad blood between them. Yet they're both very similar in their approach, mm -hmm. and and people say, oh well, this is the end of the West, and it's like I don't think it was the end of the West. I think what happened was America was not ready for the changes. The, the, mm. the deconstruction, which is really a reconstruction. It, mm. What it said was, is because uh, they're saying, "Oh, you know, this is this is terrible." You know, uh, he's 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 destroying the the American the, the myth of America. He hates America, and yet he's saying this is America. This is part right. of it. You know, remember, this is this is part of a, the the Once Upon a Time trilogy. You know, right, right. so Once Upon a Time in the West is the first one. 
Duck You Sucker, AKA uh, Fistful of Dynamite, uh, slash the original name was originally uh, um, Once Upon a Time, The Revolution. And then number number three was Once Upon a Time in America. Mm -hmm. And so you 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 see um, kind of the, what, what's he, 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 uh, he shows you, right. Yeah. You, you have the first one is, is about, we, we have the Mexicans, um, Mexican, uh, uh, immigrants or the Mexican in, uh, in the United States we have as a protagonist. And then you have, um, uh, I think Car Claudia Cardinelli, you know, she, she, are we allowed to have spoilers here already? Or, yeah, yeah, total spoilers. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. The whole series okay, is spoilers. So she, yeah. Every single so time about all these spoilers. <laughs> I guess I want to make sure. Yeah. You know, I thought we were just going to focus on the opening, but, but, but yeah, she's, you know, she's a prostitute who's, who, who right. is the, uh, who was uh, the bride, you know, of a of a uh, I, I think the the her husband who's who's killed then in the literally the next scene after that right. um, is you know he he's Irish right so the second one is about Irish and and then the uh, with J, uh, James Coburn is in it and then the the third one of course Jewish and I uh, think you know immigrants I mean Italian yeah. And, um, yeah yeah so you have these it, it's all about immigrants it's all about uh, the 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 heart of America, and so. Right. Um, but getting back to the opening scene, I don't know. Yeah. Almost, I, I just <laughs> no, because, I it. but but it's all part of it. It's all part of that. Um, um, it, it's all part of that opening because you've got the three guys that come in: Woody Strode and Jack Elam, and then the other, the third person. And and you think, okay, these are your archetypes, and they're waiting. Yes. But he makes it very interesting yes. because it's not just stylish stylistic choices that he's coming in it's like he's he's setting up the character right yeah, jack right. elam is, is 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 itchy and so he's he's a violent man and so the 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 the, the fly even the fly is, is is his prey right <laughs> right 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 and and woody strode you know he's a bad i mean we show we, we don't tell him say say he's a badass you know these these you know there's so much exposition in a lot, a lot of films today they say that guy's a badass and yeah. it's like this <laughs> right. one the water's falling and you're like so what what so what does that mean but then all of a sudden he takes the brim of his hat and he drinks it yeah i'm like okay that's pretty badass i would never do that this is kind of sick but <laughs> right. man this guy this guy you know that tells you they probably haven't had a lot of water yep right but here's the key though um that also foreshadows a part of the plot. Mm. Why? Because uh, um, what's his name? The, Irish, the Irishman. Remember, part of the plot is, is that um, he's waiting for his bride, and who was a former prostitute, right. and and what and they're they're all, they're all calling him crazy, yeah. right? Because yeah. he builds this he, he's he builds this 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 thing uh, the this ranch on land that in the middle of the nowhere. But you find out that he's he's struck upon water, and so he gambles that the train station is going to be built past that because they're going to need water. It's got to be a stopover at that point, and so he's very prescient in that. And and of course, before he's killed, you know, I mean, we find out that the the widow is uh, when she comes, she's she, you know uh, arrives later on. We find out that he's not, um, you know, he's given the. I mean, he's the widow, so that's her land now. Yeah. And so, but 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 stipulation is that um, they have to build a uh, um, uh, was it the, the the train station before the train comes there? Otherwise, they lose lose the rights to the land. Right. Um, right. So that's that. Well, that's that one part of the story, and, and so that's that sets up that opening scene in that way. Yeah. But the second part of the the, the the parallel story that sets up the the the, the widowed bride yeah. uh, story, uh, but but it sets this one also sets up um, uh, uh, what's his name um, Charles Bronson's character right yes. uh, whose name called Harmonica. You're going why yeah. <laughs> Harmonica? He has no real name in this thing. I mean, he actually right. in the middle of the film he's he's like and henry fonda's frustrated that you know later on he's like who are you who are you and he gives him the names of all these other people he killed henry oh, fonda killed right, right? yes yes, yes. <laughs> he's like he goes oh, he's dead that guy's dead but who are you really <laughs> but he's just known throughout the entire film he's a man with no name but he's just known by harmonica yep. and, and and so i thought that's really cool because um, it's all about the sound design. It doesn't yeah. open with with oh, the yeah. with a. It doesn't open with this big, um, 
uh, fanfare, the Western fanfare. It opens exactly. with sound design. We're like going, tick, tick, yeah, tick, tick, <laughs> exactly. Tick, <laughs> tick, <laughs> <laughs> right? exactly. You know, everything is about that. And you're like, what? But I felt like that. That tells me more about the old West than the, than the fanfare. The fanfare of of all these old westerns is is oh, we're coming in. Uh, th this is the, this is this is kind of the whistle blowing to say. The dog whistle would say, "We are so great. This is the greatness of America." And right. that, I'm going to tie this in with uh, also with Zach Slider later on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but this this entire but this one is like the sound design is coming in, mm -hmm. and and you're going you're getting into the train tracks of the old west. You're getting into the station. You're getting into the 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 um, the mediocrity of the of the the moment. Yes. The mundane of of yes. the old West, which we don't yes. really see. Everyone's like, the old West must have been great. Well, galloping we don't go. Horses, since, right? Like it's always galloping horses and gunslingers. Yeah, and, yeah, it's all big yeah, and yeah. loud, yeah. and yeah. things are happening. It's like the old West wasn't like that, really. But until something happens, which is great. <laughs> right. <Exactly. laughs> so that's what I love about this is because this these guys are coming in and they're they're just waiting, and you just don't you're, you're wondering who they are. And and again, Leon originally wanted the the three from the previous films to be, you know, ultimately they're gunned down, right? Yeah, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, he asked, uh, what's his, um, uh, so so um, uh, so I lost my track of my oh, uh, Charles Bronson, you know, you know, he comes down. I, I mean, the first time his introduction is really the sound of his harmonica, right. Right. Exactly. So everybody's introduced, and it's funny because you think that the the three characters are are prominent. You think that they must have been set up, and he just kills them instantly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Right. They're all in the first ten minutes. Yeah. Right. Because they were. So, but 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 the thing is, is that I I thought about this. And I'm like, I kind of wanted the. It's like initially when I first saw the movie, I was like, oh, I wonder who these guys are. They must be some badasses. Then they're gunned down. Right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And, but 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 he sets it up for the expectation like like because Woody Strode is so cool in that oh, film because yeah. if you've seen him uh, in other films Woody Strode is you know, you know uh, one of my favorites is is the Revengers I don't know if you've ever seen the Revengers I've never seen it, no. yeah it's uh so uh, William Holden you know and and so Woody Strode is in that film and and that was actually a more accurate depiction of the of the, the old West too I mean I'm I'm watching these films and going. Oh wow! I mean, maybe the, one of the reasons at the time is because audiences, you know, predominantly wanted that the, the lie of the West, right. whereas this one was telling you this is. But it, but now uh, it's it, it's no less heroic. I think what 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 I, what I love about it is that it's not even about flawed characters. It's just I, I, it resonates mm. with me mm. um, as a person, and I think mm. it will resonate with all of us if we if we tapped into we we if we told. Um, somebody in Italian American is like, wait, wait, this is your story. Don't buy into yeah. the myth of, of what what the Italians are supposed to be. Don't buy into the myth of what um, you know. The, the, uh, anybody, I mean, anybody who's who's an immigrant, we're, we're Irish, you know, or a Jewish, or anybody else like that. Let's let let's see. You know, I mean, there's the, the, there's some there's a a sense of I love these guys. Sorry, I'm I'm taking so much of this conversation. I, just, I love, love it. it. You, you keep um, going back to so many things. Let me let me let me let me direct you in an area because one of the yeah. things that you see early on in what you were saying, I want to capitalize on that, and we'll get back to some of the other stuff mm -hmm. too. We'll circle back around, but I want to get to that because you said something that I think from an impactful writing or storytelling perspective is like of the utmost importance. Mm -hmm. You know, I was I was watching reels on my phone today, which are like, you know, it's like TikTok. Yeah. It's like 10 second videos or 15 second right. videos, right? Um, and we live in a society where like, if something bores you for more than three seconds, you're like, oh, well, I need to be on my phone or something. And you mm -hmm. said it. You said a lot of people will try to do this like, it's like you're trying to get the brain to chemically react by right. cheating it or something, right? You're like, I'm going to give you something that will capture your attention, take your focus onto the thing that's happening on the screen, mm -hmm. and who cares about the storytelling? Who cares about building it all up? And this is like the antithesis of that. And you talked about that. You talked about like this is artistry, right? This is not. Mm -hmm. This isn't like your. Uh, this isn't like your your. You're walking by a 
a magician on the street and he just like throws something in front of your face. This mm -hmm. is actually something like, hang on a second. And then like starting to do a trick in front of you and it mm -hmm. gets bigger and it gets bigger and it gets bigger. And also in the cards in your back pocket, and you're like, what happened? You know, like, yeah, that's probably a terrible metaphor, but it doesn't matter. Like, no, like this fine. is really, really, really getting into storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, it's 10 minutes long. This opening mm -hmm. scene is 10 minutes long. Um, right. It might be the longest opening scene that we're going to talk about. But right. one of the things Caleb and I talked about last week was how much we love these slow burn openings. And you started covering a lot of the stuff here that happens that is so instrumental to this scene being so powerful. You talked about the sound design. He takes time, mm -hmm. to your point, he takes the time to make sure that we as an audience understand all of the sounds that are mm -hmm. supposed to be there, right? Yeah. Um, so talk a little bit more about that slow burn. You, you have... Of all the people I know, of all the writers I know, um, I would say like Leo. Leo is like a very artistic writer. Like he thinks in terms of art. Like art is circling around in his brain all the time. Every time I talk to you, we might just be passing. We're passing right. at a conference. Like we have a conversation. I'm like, oh my yeah. gosh, um, it, like it inspired my creativity um, because I'm a very much of a mechanic writer. So I'm like the opposite. So I love talking to you because it makes me excited. <laughs> um, but. So talk to me a little bit more about that slow burn and that and and the visuals that he's showing us and the sound that he's showing us. What is it that makes this scene a great opening scene? I know you I know you're giving me a lot there and there's, yeah. there's a lot to be explored, but what are these elements that you're like this is what makes this a great scene? Okay, so uh setup. Yeah. Uh, not only visually but thematically. Because mm -hmm. right, because we already talked about the water falling on on the Woody Strode, yeah. and water plays a big part because because you know the reason why they're building a railroad uh, uh, station uh, in, in that area in that part um, uh, where uh, they, it because there's water there and everyone's saying it's crazy right? right so so this is the heart this goes into the thematically the heart of the immigrant is yeah. that people said that you're too crazy to do this. But they are visionary mm. in their thinking. Yeah. They're very unorthodox in their thinking, mm. right? So that's that. That's number one. Number two, it sets up the icons of the old west, and says, "I'm going to destroy your perception of the old west." Yeah. The icons, yeah. right? <laughs> and and so here's the thing, you know, normally in the old west, in these the former westerns. The guy, you know, the, the 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 protagonist comes in. If he shoots all three of them, it's like he comes out unscathed. Yeah. Um, Charles Bronson does not come out unscathed. He gets shot, <laughs> yeah, he totally and you does. think he's dead. You know, yeah, the end of that totally scene, you're like, oh my gosh, what was the point? You you <laughs> might be. I'm already like, what was the point? I'm so pissed off. He got shot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then yeah. he gets up, and he's you know, <laughs> you know, the, with a the harmonica, and, and so the the setup there. Is 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 undermining your perceptions of the old west. The third part is is that uh, is again not just the visual and the the thematic, but um, really about the 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 setup of of um, you know everything about these guys, right? Um, uh, sorry, I lost track of what I was going to say, but um, uh, this what's what's happening is is that. Uh, you're getting an entree into the world, like and the anticipation of of what are we going to see? Um, yeah. Because here's the thing: um, when you see old west, here's the, the the thing about old western towns. Western towns, I look back and I go, "Wow, that's not really that big," you know. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But you know that that that's a you know uh, you see these old old western films and and but you know you think okay the, the, it, it's all it feels like they're all set in the, their own ways. This one was like this sets you up like what are we we trying to what are we what are we going to see, and and the fact that Sergio Leone goes from close ups these extreme close ups and you're holding there going why am I there and why is he right. pensive in the middle of action, right you know and and but yet all of a sudden he goes to the wide shot and you're like so what am I looking at and then I get, every time I look back I'm like oh I didn't notice that. There's like he composes it so that you see, you wonder, right? And so, so it's very musical, you know. I, you know, um, so you see this entire thing played out, and you feel the old west. You feel the, I mean, right yeah. down, um, uh, 
you know, when when you think about uh, Ennio Morricone's uh, his music, and it's the expansive, and but it's that it's that really cool '60s wow guitar, and you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In harmonica and 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 it's it, and it strangely enough it just really ties into kind of rock and roll. It's, it's very rock and roll in the film, yeah. um, uh, and and uh, and so you don't you don't think about this like it feels big because he sets you up for something big and then all of a sudden when it does get big, the entire town's being built. Yeah. I, you know, you know. I mean, I, I'm trying to think back of of the other, the other previous towns. Everything's built and they're set in their ways, and then the the thematically the story is like these invaders are intruding, right? right, right. This one is just like we have a vision, right. and 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 you know, it ends with a film where uh, uh, Claudia Cardinale's uh, the the widow. She, you know, she's left alone by the other two, Jason Robards, who the who's the outlaw in the film, and and of course. Uh, um, you know harmonica you know they they both r ride away but but the 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 point of the matter is is that um it was a strong woman in this film like she you come in and you think that she's going to be pushed around and yet she manipulates it like 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 what happens with uh Henry Fonda later on where she willingly sleeps with him but it was just a a, a point of manipulation mm -hmm. in that film uh which is which is different and so it takes that the shame of hey I'm a protagonist the protagonist being a prostitute coming from New Orleans, but she's trying to ma make a new life, and and right. so again, that's thematically what, what's happening is, is that these other films were about Western westward expansion, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. this one was was really about hey, uh, how as, as immigrants or or people who who uh, uh, people who are are outsiders like women, mm -hmm. how did they? turn their conditions into something even bigger oh, yeah. uh, and better and that's that that's the thematically that that's that's something that's in the in the film and and of course the, the you know to the think that charles bronson you think about representation even though you know if he is white he's playing mexican in the film and they actually had the mexican kid that plays them and uh, you know the, the the final flashback right in the in the in the, in the duel and and you think oh that's really cool like he was Mexican where we have a Mexican lead in this film you know and and what it's, what it's saying is is that Henry Fonda is like what, it's almost like saying you guys really it's like the 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 at that point he's like saying everything that you knew about the old west you guys were all lies you know uh, by saying that with with Henry Fonda in that way and yet there's Jason Robards and you 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 know <laughs> Robards. Wow, I mean, they barely say anything in this movie. Yeah, it's true. It's true, right? Yeah, but they, true. I mean, there was Academy Award-winning performances in this film where you're sitting uh, there going, you know, Robards is coming in, and, and 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 it's just like one line, monosyllabic, and and you know, you that's usually norm, you reserved for action heroes in the '80s, like Arnold Schwarzenegger and <laughs> Sylvester Stallone, and then you realize, oh wait. Maybe those guys were were kind of genius in their acting because they barely said anything, you yeah. know. True. Yeah, that's very true. It was a very. It was a. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh no, no. I was just gonna say. I was gonna. I was gonna point out some of the things that um that I totally agree with you on, and that I was gonna add to a couple of them. Um, first of all, I think you're correct in that this is a masterpiece of world building and the tension building right. at the same time. Um, you mentioned the close-ups and the wide shots, and mm -hmm. I noticed that this last time I watched it. I really noticed that because what he's doing is he's trying to – I think what he's doing is he's using those close-ups and wide shots to build the world. Because when you see a wide shot, you realize mm -hmm. this train station is out in the middle of nowhere. Like exactly. There's, there's nothing around this train station. Right. And then when he shows the close-ups, he's showing you that like – these three badass dudes, like you said, they're they were gonna be like like the gunslingers from the previous movies and stuff uh -huh. that, that we all knew were badasses. He doesn't even have to do that because they're they're just visually badasses, right? They are all they're all two things are happening with, with each one of them. They are owning what little there is, mm -hmm. right? So you mentioned the water, and, and I didn't think of this until you mentioned that when he at first, he's, it seems like he's going to be annoyed by the water, but then when he drinks it from his brim, right. you realize he goes, I own this water. This is my right. water. 
right? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, Jack Elam, when he's sitting on the bench and the and the and the uh, telegraph machine is annoying right. because it's he just pulls the wires out. Why? Right. Because he owns those wires. Like he he right. believes he does at least. Right. Right. Um, right. And so, what you the immediate thing you sense is that these guys, the reason they're badasses is not only because they look like badasses, which they do, mm-hmm. but they also seem to own everything here. It seems right. to be their stuff. Exactly. Um, exactly. Yeah crazy and then what i also love about him is 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 what sergio does here is he builds in the fact that despite the fact that they own everything Mm -hmm. jack elam's character maybe not as much but the other two guys for sure right they're still a little bit scared of what's coming right just they're kind of jumpy they're kind of not sure yeah um and then and then what i think is so cool is that this is this actually maybe makes the scene for me but when when the train starts to pull away and they're all start to relax. Yeah, exactly. You know? <laughs> yeah. Pull, well, maybe we don't have to fight today. Maybe we're, right. maybe we're, maybe we're okay. And then you said it, the harmonica starts but again, another sound. It's just right. another sound. You know? Yeah. And, um, and that just is this slow building, the slow buildup of tension and the, 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 then the lines he gives us when we finally do start talking, right? Yeah. When we finally do start talking, the lines are magic because right. essentially they're what is it? These, these two these two unstoppable forces facing off against one another yeah. and basically just saying like you're gonna lose, and they're both saying it to each other. And yeah. It's just like oh, it's awesome. So yeah, I just love what you said there. I mean that all of that was really awesome. Before I get into the next question, though. Yeah. Um, let me go ahead and read some some of the the uh, the words from our sponsors and and talk a little bit about some of the projects we're working on. So uh, I do want to thank today's sponsor and give you three ways to uh, support the show. Today's the sponsor of today's podcast is the new book Door of a Door: Lost Legends and Sagas of Pre Flood Earth. Door of a Door: Lost Legends and Sagas of Pre Flood Earth is the work of Lazarus Master Fox and Novus Renaissance. Novus Renaissance is the new platform for fan freedom, creating and defending great stories, great characters, and superb secondary worlds where fans everywhere experience adventure, <laughs> excitement, and wonder. Door of Door Volume 1, Creation Angels War, is the explosive supernatural fantasy and science fiction series of our time that immerses your imagination in a saga forged before time was thought and reality dawned. Volume 1 unleashes the account of Eternity's most ancient bloody combat, the legend of Lucifer, Heaven's Great War, and the beginning of your adventure in the forgotten world of pre-flood Earth awaits you. Door of a Door Volume 1, Creation's Angel's War, is now available on Barnes & Noble and Amazon via the link below. Uh, It's novusrenaissance.com slash door of a door. I'll spell that in a minute. The world of fans is following us. Are you? Do you dare to adventure and journey with us? and witness monsters, giants, humans, heroes, villains, and gods battle for supremacy. That's novusrenaissance.com, N-O-V-U-S-R-E-N-A-I-S-S-A-N-C-E.com slash D-O-R dash V-A-H-D-O-R. And if you want to make that easy for yourself, just click on the link in the description down below, novusrenaissance.com slash door for door. And uh, click the link, check it out. We are super grateful um, to them for sponsoring us. And we would like to, for you to support them because when they so- sponsor the show, that means that we keep to get, get, we get to keep doing shows. So it makes us very happy. Um, I also wanted to tell you uh, to support the show by going and checking out some of Leo's stuff. So Leo, where's the best place for people to check out your works? Yeah, so I have a, uh, you can look at on um uh, on uh, uh, GarageBand, was, was it? Oh my gosh, I'm just I'm blanking out. Actually, go go to my uh, uh, my Instagram. It's at uh, at Leo Partable LP7. Nice. Uh, you can find me there. Um, and uh, I just I'm blanking out on. Uh, I, I guess it's GarageBand. I'm not remember sure, but but well, I'll 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 have links on on my uh, Instagram. Um, oh, perfect. Which will because I'll I'll, I'll be uh, um debuting the soundtrack to my rock and roll movie on oh soon, so. nice yes 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 right. and we're going to talk about that some more um coming up too so I, I i can't wait for people to hear 
hear about that because it's really exciting. I think when you hear about the stuff Leo's working on, you guys will be excited about it. Um, and finally, you can check out the book that Nathan Sheck and I wrote, Death of a Bounty Hunter at deathofabountyhunter.com. Um, I personally recommend that you check out the full cast audiobook version, which you can purchase at deathofabountyhunter.com. That project was obviously a joy for us to work on. Um, and actually, if you like Once Upon a Time in the West, I feel like you would really enjoy Death of a Bounty Hunter. So go check it out. Um, and I finally, I know he's not here today, but I'm still going to suggest that you check out Caleb Monroe's work at calebmonroe.com. Links to all of those projects can be found in the show notes. I'll add Leo's um, link as well. Uh, we really do appreciate all of your support. So we've talked a lot about this scene, Leo, but if you were to pick mm-hmm. out some of like your favorite elements of this scene just for you personally the ones that stand out to you as being like i just love that this happened what are some of those things yeah actually the the jack elam and uh and woody strode scenes um just because Mm -hmm. you know part of me uh, you know i I, i've gone through a a, a different phase in terms of uh, as a writer and Mm. i went back to i was watching a lot of global cinema international cinema i hate calling it i hate calling it foreign cinema but i I just went back and just watched all the great classics and all the things you know Mm. the 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 bfi top 300 films or whatever movie (laughs) that kind of thing the last year and a half um and i'm noticing there there's a there's something very different about art we, you mm-hmm. know, like like the when when people jumped on to uh, Martin Scorsese and said, "Hey, the Marvel films aren't really art; they're gr- entertaining." You know, people said, "Oh, well, well, how can you say that's not really cinema and everything else?" It's like, well, in a way, uh, you know, it, it isn't. It, it is. It's just entertainment. Mm-hmm. Like if I go to Disneyland and I go on to a ride, it's taking me on a ride, and it I, I'm entertained. Yeah, but I'm not sitting there going uh, uh, like my mind isn't engaged on, on something to sit down and really ponder things yeah. and to to think about other things before that. It's just taking me on to the next thing. Right. You know how it is. You go into Disneyland, yeah. um, and and you know you you've got to go to the next thing. It's the yeah. next thing, next thing. Right. And I think that's the problem. I think what, what you see with Marvel films. I felt uh, like uh, I'm just going from one place to another. I'm like, uh, really? That's uh, it? I'm like. I kind of just want to watch something standalone, you know, mm-hmm. in, in a way, and and just stay away. I mean, they, I could play in the same world, but I need to know why these characters exist. It's like these yeah. characters exist for the event. Yeah, they don't exist as an individual entity anymore. They exist and- to perpetuate the Marvel myth or the Disney mm-hmm. myth. Mm. And and I feel that, that that's kind of like America, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there's the America American myth, and then there's American dream. And I'm really more about the American dream because the American dream is about how we all participated in this great experiment right. uh, to make the greatest democracy in, in history. Right. Mm-hmm. That's really what it is. And so I don't. Right. That's the difference. I, th- I think that's why the you know uh, I mean um, diversity is great f- in in that way because. You know, I, I was in China. I'm not China. I was in Thailand a number of years ago, and I I, I was in this car. Where they we we they shuttled us to. We um we were going to his um I can't remember what was the ship, but mm. um, but we had I had these two Chinese these two Chinese uh fellows came in, and and they heard me and my brother talking, and they're like, "You're American, you're American." It was like we love American movies, and they're telling me all this other stuff, and 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 they and they the the thing is is that they they love them because we are Americans, and mm. and and so the the thing is they don't they don't want to see movies about Chinese made by um, um by made by Americans Chinese movies about the Chinese culture, mm. they want to see movies about Chinese Americans, they want to see uh, uh, they want to see Filipino Americans, they want to see Japanese Americans, they want to see. The, what is uniquely American, you know, yeah. right? That's yeah. why Fast and the Furious and all these other films do well. Uh, but, and why, uh, the, what is it? Um, uh, Crazy Rich Asians is like, well, they're looking at like, we see this all the time, mm. you know, where's mm. the American? Where are the Chinese Americans? Right. That's what we want to see. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I went off on a tangent on there um, in regards to no, the question. I think that what you're saying is that, um, well, I you tell me you tell me, but I think what you're saying is that this film is is 
and we talked about this a little bit already, but yeah, this film is breaking down some of what, and I actually, I actually never thought of this before, but if you do a comparison of Marvel and DC, so mm-hmm. I have been on the record. I, I really enjoy the Marvel films, right? I do too. But, I but I, I, I usually tend to prefer the DC films. And here's the reason why you have actually said it. You've, you've, you've created a good parallel for me. Cause what I have said is I have said, I feel like a lot of times the Marvel films are very safe. They're very mm-hmm. safe films. They're not, they're not, they, most of the time, but there are a few exceptions. I think Guardians of the Galaxy is an exception. Yeah, to yeah. The Loki is an exception to this. Um, mm-hmm. But they don't cause you to think afterwards. They do just move you on to the next piece of entertainment that you're supposed to enjoy. Um, right. Whereas with DC films, a lot of times I'm thinking about the DC film like weeks after I've seen it. Um, and I think that what you are what you are capitalizing here is this idea of of the myth versus the dream. And the mm-hmm. difference between the two is a really powerful way of stating the two things. Because in the myth, it is the thing that we want to repeat to ourselves so that we feel good about what we believe. And that's Marvel. Marvel's just repeating back to you what you already believe. So you can Disneyland. Feel good about it's, it. It's yeah, Main exactly. Street. It's Main exactly. Street. They're, they're, so, they're, 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 yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so, but what I think. What I think DC has done that's a little bit different is I think that DC oftentimes causes you to question what you previously believed. And that that's, I think that that's where art becomes more interesting is when it causes me to question what I have previously believed. Mm-hmm. And so you brought up, before we started talking about this film, you had brought that up in the context of saying that that's what Zack Snyder was doing with Superman, which I totally agree with. He was like, let's recontextualize, deconstruct Superman and show you a different side, right? A side that right. maybe we've seen in the comics a little bit, but we really never had seen on film. Right. So if you compare like the Zack, the Man of Steel film to the to the Donner uh, Superman films, very different types of uh, films there. And I think what, what the, the, the way that affects this film and this opening scene is very much to your point that this was a deconstruction of what the myth of the old West was, where it was like the guys in the white hats have to defeat the guys in the black hats or worse, mm-hmm. the guys in the white hats, hats have to fight off the savage Indians, mm-hmm. right? Like, right. Um, yeah. and, and this was really saying like, actually people of all creeds and all backgrounds, and especially the guys with the really blue eyes, Right, have some serious problems, and we're going to yeah. put all of those problems into the same place and watch those problems work themselves out. And I, y- you're helping me understand why, like, this is one of the f- reasons I love this film and why the setup is so good because it really truly is taking, like, what you said. It's it's not giving you the myth that you already believe in that you want just repeated back to you so that you can feel good about yourself. It is also saying, no, no, no. Think about what the dream is and then realize what reality looks like. And the d- difference between the dream and the reality is where what we're fighting toward. And we still right. have more room to go. <laughs> right? Like, right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's fantastic. That's- that is the dream. I mean, uh, yeah. that's Sergio Leone. Uh, you know, it's very operatic. Mm. You know, and and but you know, the opening scene also they pull back. They, they don't have the the Western fanfare for a reason. Is because yeah. with if you had the Western fanfare, you're going to lose the fact that we're isolating the lone harmonica. Yes, harmonica. That's who he is. So the sound design is all about what are the sounds of the West. Yep. And so, so it, what it does is, and, and people hate this deconstruction. It's like, well, I wanted that fanfare to tell me that I'm in the gold West and everything else, which is one yeah. of the flaws. I should, I, again, I love for the longest time, Wish Your Daughter Superman was one of my all time yeah. favorite movies, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. And still is. Yeah. But, but you know, the, the, the difference, like the Wish Your Daughter Superman represents me growing up. And 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 all of, uh, and then all of a sudden the Man of Steel is a realization of like I'm not that character. Yeah, I'm Man of Steel, and the reason why is because what happens is that you see uh, just like Sergio Leone, mm-hmm. there's no Superman is about all about the fanfare. Dun, da, dun, da, 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 da. And so everyone goes, like, well, see, that's the heart of Superman. I'm like, really? That's the heart of Superman? Is that the fanfare? Right. Because that's that's what what people are resonating with. Right. They're resonating with Superman showing up. And 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 saying okay, like like uh, I saw people in a, you know one of my favorite shows is actually Superman and Lois. Um, oh, yeah. 
because it actually, uh, it, it, but but it also shows some of the flaws in the thinking of why people think Superman is one this way. Because they they said, oh, when Superman shows up with, you know, uh, you know, the, he saves the black kid, and he mm. he tells the kid, uh, he's tell, he tells the kid, oh. He goes, nice costume. He's like, yeah, my mother made it. And so I see these people post like, that's the heart of Superman. I'm like, really? The heart of Superman is the theme, which is the immigrant. It's a loner. And yeah. and and when they said stuff like Superman didn't smile, Superman caused destruction and everything else. Well, well 1938, the first opening of action comics, he's causing destruction. <laughs> everyone's gonna get everyone's gonna get scared. He's yeah. throwing people out of planes. He's 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 fighting for social justice and all these other things. And what Zack Snyder did, just like Sergio Leone, he said, Super this is Superman. He's a loner. Mm -hmm. He's probably got on the autistic spectrum, right? When you were a kid, everything's too big for you. Mm. So you've got that audience, mm. uh, and and so and and then so he's also very uniquely Asian. He's very coded Asian because he doesn't say much. Mm. He's not though. The thing is that people want these guys to say a lot mm. to feel make them feel good. Say something to me that that makes me feel like you're actually part of us. Mm. Superman's like, uh, you know, I could literally kill anybody, and and my dad's telling me that this government hates me. Like, really, if they find you, they're right. going to kill you, right? Right. Of course, they're going to feel that way, and so of course, he's not going to be smile. And and if you notice, the only time he smiles is the people that he loves, like like the waitress is his friend, or he probably you know was was dating her. Yeah. Lois, his mom, you know, just those those kinds of things, the things that mean most important. And it felt like a western. The Battle of Smallville really felt like a Sergio Leone film. He's like walking. He's like, yeah, sure. stay out, stay out. Yeah. Get down. But the, everyone wants to go. You. Get over there, you get it because yeah. they want the Western monomyth, right? And and so Superman is again is uniquely, uh, I mean, because the, the the scene in the bar, uh, where where uh, not the bar but but the roadside cafe, yeah. and the guy is 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 first of all sexually harassing the the the, yes. the waitress, and Superman felt very Asian because he does mm -hmm. he puts his head down and says you should stop don't say that because we don't want to you know Asians don't want to say much you know and, mm -hmm. and and the guy's just hitting him and hitting him doing all this other stuff um the western monomyth the the the, the, the kind of superman everyone wants is like okay do something really fun and so do your heat vision on the yeah. sly and this is gonna <laughs> burn and uh, oh yeah it, he goes that's Superman yeah I'm like no you know when we watch movies we're, we're here to watch for catharsis. That's mm -hmm. a lo much longer, that's a lifetime of loving uh, mm -hmm. a film. That's artistry. Mm -hmm. If it's all about Superman shows up and says, hey, this is, you know, it's all fun and games and everything. That's why the, the, the Donner films, I mean, literally, uh, like, people of color, the first, the only person of color that shows up is the, is, uh, is uh, um, the, 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 the black guy who's, who's, a, who's a, a pimp. You know, and the two prostitutes, right? He says, excuse me. And everyone goes, oh, hilarious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes, oh, cool. You know, and everybody is a sideline. People of color sideline. And and you don't realize that some of that stuff is, you know, you know there's sexual assault with Larry Hagman, right? The general on yeah. Miss Tessmacher. And there's all these things that are very problem. And again, it this is how... Hollywood has conditioned its writers, the Joss Whedon kind of thing, mm -hmm. you know, without really thinking. It's like, oh, we, 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 everybody's a sideline to use as a, you know, a, as a, a make it make it funny and that sort right. of thing. Right. Um, that's the other thing about this Sergio Leone film. It, people weren't sidelined in a way. Uh, it, it was it was like, oh, they're they're we're setting them up to be the the comic relief. You're sitting there going, you you they're amplifying the loneliness. Yes. Right. And and yep. so so even you, you're you're thinking like well, Jason Robards when he says you're the only beautiful woman, blah blah blah. You yeah. you can feel these guys, but they don't really come after her. Right. They're ju you're just feeling like oh wow, it's really lonely in the West. This is why they had prostitutes. Right. Right. right? right. But they're not sidelined, and you made fun of them. Right. The that that is entertainment writing. Yeah. That is Joss Whedon writing. Yeah, right, yeah, and, yeah. and and I hate to, to put put him, but but a lot of times, and and that's what sometimes I think with J uh, J Abrams because he's a television writer, so you're engaging people, and so yeah. I think that's the problem with Star Wars. You're not really getting the heart. Mm. Star Wars is very 
much Sergio Leone, the heart, very, mm -hmm. because again, George Lucas comes in and says, hey, um, the Asians aren't the bad guys, like in Flash mm -hmm. Gordon. Flash Gordon, being the merpolisless Asians, right? The Asian menace or anything. It's, I mean, the empire, the British empire, the American empire, yeah. right? And he's saying the people in the, the desert, you know, Middle East and people, uh, the Viet Cong. <laughs> it's like, yeah. listen, yeah. they're just trying to fight. Right. He, he reverses. He's, he's totally, and it, it, it's no, I mean, that's one of the reasons why George Lucas loves, you know, Once Upon a Time in the West and Martin Scorsese. They're not coming down on America. They're just saying, we're, let's, let's refocus on the American dream. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So this is, yeah. ah, there's so much. And so that's what I think the Zack Snyder films did was it's, he's a visual storyteller like yep. Sergio Leone. I'm still watching the movies. I'm like, oh, I missed that. I know. Oh, because that's like he's re referencing great, great film directors. He's referencing films. I'm watching, when I watch Sam Fuller, you know, The Naked Kiss, I can feel so much of the Zack Snyder, mm -hmm. uh, you know, America. I watch a lot of these noir films. Um, I watch Breathless. I mean, revisiting Breathless. Yeah. And, and, and uh, Francois Truffaut and Jean Luc Godard. And they're all looking at uh, going, this is the America that we see. Like we, 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 a lot of people don't even recognize that this really American culture in these French films, oh, but yeah. but there's a there's a truth, you know, to it, and so they're amplifying, and so the, I think that's that that's the difference, and so yeah, pe when people say oh, entertainment, entertainment, it's like a you, it, first and foremost things are are about entertainment. It's like no, yeah, first and foremost things are about art because art is the rest of your life. It's the thing that gives you the life at this moment and gives yeah. you a reason for, for living. Because oh, in these that. Marvel films, I don't know until recently. I mean, I actually resonated more with Falcon and Winter Soldier because I thought, oh, oh that's, yeah. I understand that more. Yeah. You know, and and, and that's why I, I couldn't, with, with Iron Man and Captain America and everything else, I mean, Thor, he was stripped of his, you know, uh, being a, 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 um, a doctor. And and he, he he's a doctor with a, a disability, mm. right? So so that was the thing that connected originally. Now it's gone. Oh, Hulk! You mean Hulk? No, I'm talking about uh, I'm talking to Thor, uh, uh, Doctor Don Blake. Oh, you know? okay, okay, okay. Right? Remember yeah. in the in the comic books, Doctor Don Blake, his alter ego. Uh, he he was walking with a cane and everything else, and he found the the, in the uh, and so that 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 very same thing. I mean. Yeah. This is a frontliner, and all the Marvel films ripped out all the things that could have been relevant for today, for well, the sake of entertainment. You know, that, so. the, one, the reason why I said Hulk and the way you made me think of Hulk was that, like, um, oh, Bruce Banner, same thing, right? Yeah, Bruce Banner, same, like, like, like Bruce Banner's whole thing mm -hmm. was that he had he was a genius who right. lacked self control, exactly, and that's what made him so human. And then when they made like the smart Hulk or whatever they call him. I yeah. can't remember what they called him. Yeah. It, just took, it took all of the interesting things of the character and like, totally right. Did. Right. So, and like, that's the thing. I think when, when people say uh, we, we need to make DC uh, more relatable, I'm not thinking, wait, I think it's because your unconscious bias, mm -hmm. you think that America needs to sound, look like this. And yet DC comics, Superman, mm -hmm. You can't relate to him as a teenager because he grew up in Smallville. You can't relate to him as a, as a kid who's adopted. Somebody's going to relate to him. Yeah. You can't relate to him uh, as uh, as a guy working in a you know in a, a in a reporter's job. You know, just grunt work, and yeah. um, you can't relate to him as an immigrant. I mean, what you're saying is is that we want to erase all that kind of stuff. I can't relate to it. Right. I, I see people right. say I can't relate to that, right. and yet. Thor is really just, they go, I relate to Thor, but why? Because he's a prince? <laughs> right. How's right. that relatable now? I mean, before, before he was Don Blake and you related to it. Yeah. And, and, and same thing with Batman. Batman, was, you know, he's, he's, he's got trauma. Right. Whereas, you know, I mean, yeah, Tony Stark all of a sudden is like, oh, I realize that I've been doing bad because this had to happen. Right. I mean, from the very get-go, Batman is like, oh, my world was, you know, was this legacy yeah. of of the Waynes, and then you you now you're different with different versions. It's like, hey, you know, there's a, there's a lot more to it. Um, but this Batman res resonates with me more because you know what? 
if if it was grounded in real quote reality, yeah. there's no way that he'd have the weapons to fight the aliens coming up. That was the point <laughs> yeah. of the movie. It's <laughs> right, like right. it's like ev- the violence was escalating, and Batman lost his soul. And and but then it was a it was a prelude to something even bigger. Yeah, yeah. So so there's a genius in in what Zack Snyder was doing w- yeah. by not putting in these jokey moments. What he was doing is like I want you to sit down. <laughs> And really find out what is going on. It felt yeah. if you if you watch Once Upon a Time in America, uh, any of Leon's films, mm-hmm. you watch all these uh, you know anything by Sam Fuller, Bud Bedecker, and then you sit down and watch uh, anything by Don Siegel, and then you watch Zack Snyder's. Then you'll understand mm. that mm-hmm. there is a tie between the superhero genre and the and the Western films. Now, yeah. the Marvel films are more Rio Bravo, and I love Rio Bravo, one of the greatest films ever made. But yeah. at the same time, that's another America, but that's not well, me. And that's you know? a really good point. What you just said is a really good point, and that is that – and this is why I love going back to your two um, – the two words you're using in terms of myth and dream is that when it comes to Marvel films, when it comes to Disney films – um, and, and, and by the way, there, I think Disney has like shifted a little bit over the years too, because yeah. I, I remember like, you know, even today you can still ride, uh, Mr. Toad's wild ride at Disneyland, mm-hmm. which, right. is, which is a ride where you get off that ride. You actually do have to think about it for a second because a, a wild and crazy life where you don't really care about other people and you just do nefarious things and yeah. you attract nefarious people into your life. And then you find yourself, you know, driving around crazily and then you run into a train and then you go to hell like, like that's yeah. that's how the ride ends yeah <laughs> exactly so, but, but that's not what we see anymore and he, like even even I, I remember they said we're gonna we're gonna retheme the big coaster in in california adventure we're gonna retheme it to the incredibles and i thought oh, oh that'd be cool we'll have we'll to see what they do well it's just it's just a very simple like chase your kid around um mm-hmm. we're just gonna chase our kid around so that we can get him back and I thought to myself, like, oh, that doesn't really say anything about the world. It, mm-hmm. is, it makes no commentary about the world at all, as opposed to yeah. Mr. Toad's Wild Ride that made a lot of commentary on the world, right? So right. the two examples you're giving, and, and, and I think that what you're saying and what I would agree with is that we're not saying that Marvel movies are bad. We're not saying that Marvel movies are something you shouldn't watch. We're not saying that Marvel movies are um, uh, – in. we're not even saying that they're inferior – what we're yeah. saying is they're different, and the purpose of them is different. Yeah. I go Marvel to- Marvel films are superior entertainment. Yes, that's, that, that's that, that, I just you know that's fine. It's it's okay, it's and yeah. I need superior entertainment. But there's just times where I'm sitting here going, "You're just taking me on a ride, and I'm getting bored." And yeah, exactly. I need to I need to know exactly the heart of the story. Like that's why the the Justice League when they when the Zack Snyder's Justice League when they revealed the cyborg. And yeah. and then you go back to Batman versus Superman, and you've got Batman. This is he's got the fastest boot on Superman, and all of a sudden you realize, oh, he could. That's an immigrant right there. Yeah. Or black people are, you know, same thing. You know, everything that was that's happening, that's America. Right. And 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 now you know the crazy things about what Lex Luthor was saying. Even the movie actually makes sense now. You just have to sit down. And you go, oh, that's that's terrible <laughs> acting. But at the same time, you're going. Yeah, but I'm watching Once Upon a Time in in the West, and 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 you might dismiss it, you know, if you're just watching it, if you're looking for something else. Right. But these people are saying some profound things in there. Yeah. Yeah. Just like even even it might be you go, that's kind of boring. He didn't say it in the way that that engaged me. I'm like, yeah, but the thing is, is that what, what the, the 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 point is that it tells you what kind of person you are. Yes. And so entertainment is all about make me happy. Yes. yes. So you don't get to see anybody else around you. Yeah. But yeah. this thing is it's like if you watch it and you're going, okay, uh, it's not about me. I'm going to see what you have to offer and tell me. So I think that's the that's the, the difference in in, mm-hmm. in these films. Um, yeah, I think that's really true. And 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 we're going to transition into this next question, which is like uh-huh. from a storytelling perspective, as a storyteller, what are some of the elements of this scene that really make – it work from a storytelling perspective. And let me just start out. I'll start out on this one, then I'll hand it over to you. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I was going to start out was because I'm going to piggyback off of what you just said, which is to say that when you talk about, when you talk about art, Mm -hmm. 
it can be very difficult to receive art if you're living in a hurried, busy, overwhelmed state of mind. And almost mm -hmm. always you will prefer entertainment over art if you if you you find yourself in in that place of busyness and that place mm -hmm. of eating like for example i've been really really busy um and uh we're gonna go my wife and i are gonna go to disney world <laughs> next week mm, that's I great can't wait. i can't wait because i can't wait yeah. to like like like, like yeah. take off the thinking cap and just enjoy things mm -hmm. but but to receive art I think you need to be you need to be sucked into it so that you can really concentrate on it, really understand what's going on. You're not listening to the other people in the theater eat their popcorn or or drink. Like you have to become silent, right? You have to become you have to get into the fact that I am I am investing in this thing and what is it going to tell me? So the first storytelling thing that I think is really magical about um, once upon a time in the West that piggybacks off of what you were saying is that when we go to see art, we need to almost be put in a place that allows us to receive the art. Well, and I think that this opening scene does that really well mm -hmm. because it, it, by, by engaging our senses, our visual senses, wide shots, close-ups um, mm -hmm. it's telling us pay attention to these things by engaging the sound. There's the windmill turning. There's the mm -hmm. dripping of the dripping under the hat there's the telegraph machine these things are like drawing us into an environment and a setting they're not there's nothing there's no fanfare like you said there's nothing that's like loud and like taking us out of it where we can just go like oh cool i'm entertained it's sucking us in mm -hmm. um, and i think that that is what i would say is one of the primary things we could learn as a, as storytellers uh, and if it's a visual medium then this is basically saying visual and audio uh medium then it's using those visual cues and those audio cues to put us in a place of receptivity to art. Um, and I think that that is really fantastic. So what are some of the things that you think storytellers could take away from the opening scene of, of Once Upon a Time in the West? Oh, number one is patience. patience. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Patience, because that's a that's a mad. The, the thing is, is that people there's there's entertainment. So entertainment just says, get this over with and so we can get on to the next thing. Mm. Right, mm. Um, and and continue with the thing. And I and and the, the rule of thumb is don't get bored. Mm. Um, don't don't bore the audience. Okay, it's okay. That's fine. So that's entertainment. Yeah. Um, you know, and the, the I'm reminded of a, there's a I think Sergio Leone talked about there's a there's a art house there's a, a theater that played once upon a time in the West for an entire year in mm. Paris, and you know, and and basically the guy yelled at him said. You know, I had to watch this movie over and over again. It's so boring, so boring. Nothing happens, you know. Uh, and and so part of it is that um, art is about patience and it's about rhythm. And some of the best art is not necessarily immediately drawing you in, but rather it's it it's it's kind of like a siren song. It's on oh, that's mm. about, by the entire harmonica thing. You're like, okay, so what is it? I don't want to go there. Oh, well, you know what? Let me go check it out. See, yeah, it, it yeah. actually, it's a divide. It, it, it divides us. Art mm -hmm. is supposed to divide us. It's to, to divide the person who is very, who, who is really all about themselves mm -hmm. and the person that says, I want to expand my mind. So therefore, I'm going to wait. So that's what all about patience. And it's not just about, um, uh, okay, this is a boring scene. This is a boring shot. He He's a musical maestro. And that the, the if you watch the editing in that, there, even though there is not the the traditional music that the, in the background, you know, Ennio Morricone's not in there. Um, you have the music. So I, I have synesthesia, so I hear colors. So I understand as a musician, everything I, I see uh, makes music. So what he's doing, it's like this beautiful tick. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, and then the eyes, and then you're going, and then, then there's the silence, right? Then, then, then there's that part, the part uh, you know, uh, called the sashura. You know, it's the, that point where you have to stop, and 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 then it, you know, the anticipation, and it gives you, gives you that that kind of a cool, uh, allows you for the big mic drop each time, mm, you know. Mm, mm. So, so there's this rhythm and this pattern that you're seeing, and it's an interplay between the visuals and. Uh, and and the sound, 
So what he's doing is he's expanding the, the possibilities of, um, of cinema. And yet also, um, uh, I think one of my favorite uh, filmmakers, Abbas Kiarostami talked about, you know, super, uh, cinema is supposed to um, put you to sleep. And I didn't really understand for a little bit for a while, but in the, uh, I now understand because I actually do fall asleep in good movies. Yeah, seriously yeah. enough, I do because I I end up feeling like God, this is, I'm in a different world, and I'm you know, and, and but then the, the, it forces me to go back and watch it again and and again because that's what this movie you know uh, you know I'll be honest when I first when I first saw it when I was a kid I'm like oh God. <laughs> Why is this, this is, you know, this isn't like Good and the Bad and the Ugly because there's something different about, you know, Good and the Bad and the Ugly had a little bit more of the, you know, up-tempo at some point. Even though it was slow, there's something in engaging. This one was like, oh, I don't get these things, dang it. You know, and I was 14 when I first saw it. So, um, yeah, and so I'm watching this thing and, uh, um, you know, uh, on video and it's like, okay, whatever. But then... I keep watching it and revisiting it and you see this and and as a storyteller you have to understand pacing and and we yeah. keep talking about what does pacing mean and and people think pacing means make sure that you don't get the audience to fall to to be bored mm -hmm. and okay again I'm going to say this you you it's not about being bored it's being engaged mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. you might be bored the reason why you're bored is because you you don't know what you're watching Yes. So that that tells you, that tells me something about a person. So like if I talk to a person so, and say, so I didn't really like this, it didn't resonate with me, I didn't get it. That's okay. But don't tell me it's stupid. <laughs> what it does is say, right? I mean, don't use ableist language in that way. And then and all of a sudden, you know, that that just tells me that, okay, that's who you are. Right, right, right. Okay, so that's why we, the, we, we form these communities because all of a sudden, if you're a real filmmaker, I think, I think um, uh, if you want to be an artist, this is, this is textbook on how to do an opening without, and again, without, you know, saying stuff. Everyone, yeah. I mean, this is written, again, we, we're talking guys like um, Dario Argento and, and Bernardo Bertolucci worked on this screenplay. I mean, the great masters, there's three masters on this film. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Oh, and there's yeah. a reason for that. So, yeah. Yeah. I think that that's fantastic, by the way. I think that's a really good piece of advice for artists. And, and that was our last question. So, we're just going to close out this show um, mm -hmm. with the time that we have left. I just want to hear a little bit about your projects. I know, um, especially because you have told me about the rock and roll film for a few years and you're making yeah. some moves on that. So tell us about that a little bit. And then also tell us about um what's you know music to my ears is the is the the Indiana Jones inspired project <laughs> that you're working on because that's my favorite film as well. So right. tell me tell me a little bit about those. So okay so because of COVID I had to stop I mean I had to figure out how to shoot my rock and roll film. And we were about to go shoot a number of really scenes that right right at the start of covid where it's like oh crap this i'm really need i had to rethink the entire movie literally it was i was so sad and then i was watching movies like i mean by chris marker uh marker he, he he directed um uh oh gosh um sans soleil you know and and uh i don't know if you've ever seen um uh Le Jeté. You know, which was the insp the inspiration for uh, Twelve Monkeys, and it's oh, it's, it's all nice. shot with photographs and you know, and, and um, it's all it's all photographs and sound design. So it's all oh, awesome. visually. So anyway, to get, make a long story short, what I did was I said, okay, why don't I restructure this and, and make it more like it's it's about a, a a rock singer, you know, being interviewed, you know, uh, on the eve of the release of his, his of his music, and it will the the music will um there's about 17 music videos and and sequences um and uh, and i what i did was like why don't i structure it kind of like sans soleil or agnes varda's films if you've ever seen some of her films um one of her she she directed a, a great film called cleo five to seven um she was the she's the god the, the godmother of fr the french new wave so anyway oh, i so what i did was i i started looking at all these different guys and said I'm going to think out of the bounds, and this is what it's going to look like structurally. I'm going to use uh, Fellini's Eight and a Half. Mm -hmm. um, I'll use, um, uh, there, there was uh, um, Heavy Metal, 
Mm. So I started compositing, like some of the sequences has uh, it was in, really directly inspired by heavy metal, um, the, uh, the the comic book, the, you know, nice. or metal hurlant more, and and uh, all the and music videos uh, I watched like USA Night Flight, uh, the, from the, the stuff that was in the 1980s and all this other innovations, different things yeah. in the 1960s, put it all together. And I said, I thought to myself, I'm gonna make a narrative film based on this. Um, but but each time it, it's, a, it's a commentary, it's like a, um, a, a social commentary, the way that uh, uh, Jean-Luc Godard did with Weekend and all these other things, you know, people talk, but then it's over visuals and everything else. And, uh, but then I also wanted to introduce in this alternate world, uh, my own um, alter ego, it, it's like movies that I want to do. So there's a scene in there, one of the songs is called The Meaning of Fear, but it's actually the, the movie Meaning of Fear. And it's, a, it's about a, 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 a cowboy, a, a cowboy, a gunslinger in the old West named um, Jesse St. Malo. And he's a, um, he's Filipino. And and I looked at everything in this thing, and I thought, wow, I'm gonna I'm gonna set it during the height of uh, post post Civil War, uh, post Mexican, uh, you know, uh, you know the everything that was that was happening during that time. There's up yeah. upheaval, up, 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 up. and I thought to myself, this will be really the real birth of the nation, of 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 the of real birth of America, because it's it deals with the Ku Klux Klan, uh, Confederate gold. Um, and then, of course, a little bit of supernatural elements like like the Vir Virgin Mary of Guadalupe. So I thought, OK, I'm going to mash all those things up and take it further from Spielberg, Lucas and Leon, put it all together and, and reconfigure the myth in that way. And the other stuff, heavy metal inf influenced by that, influenced by EDM, uh, rockabilly. And so, you know, so the first part of the, the soundtrack I'll, I'm releasing is part one. And I call it a, it's kind of a cinematic um uh mixtape journey is what is what i'm that's calling awesome. it so real good so that's there's and that and that, when does that come out? well i'm releasing first one i would release is the the seven music videos mm. uh this uh, later this summer and then uh, as i'm you know working on the film and so will those, be know, on, will those be on youtube as well yeah yeah. Oh, that's awesome. yeah all the i mean just those are all i mean i have a kind of a set schedule of putting it all out so i'm very in this this entire the, the music the soundtrack is very inspired by um you know elvis the beatles prince michael jackson you know uh, i mean great. anything that you see kanye west things that you see uh, all about america what what's uniquely american mm -hmm. and 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 uh k-pop i'm a huge k-pop fan so you, you cool. see a lot of this stuff uh coming in and and uh, and, and so i wanted to to make something kind of like a, a cultural marker of the time yeah. And um, and then, you know, release uh, some some related projects in it. So it, it'll it's a little bit different in terms of the storytelling. Um, it's like my dinner the way that my dinner with Andre. Oh yeah. You know, <laughs> where you're like, oh, it's just all about a conversation, but no, it's, there's real storytelling in it. You know, right. Or, or, right. You know. So yeah, I want to I want to so do cool. something. That sounds so cool, and I can't wait to start seeing those music videos and then see the full film when it comes out. That sounds yeah, really awesome. great. Um, one more time before I give the outro for the show, give people how to reach you on your Instagram so they can go check out what you're up to. Okay. So it's at Leo Partable at hot at Leo Partable, uh, LP seven, L E O P A R T I B L E L P seven. Um, that's kind of, a, that's my AKA in the film is L, the, the character's name is LP seven. Oh, nice. Um, or he goes by that as a, as a rock singer. Um, and, and so, uh, yeah, um, that, that's, uh, and I think it's a uh, garage band. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Bandcamp. Sorry. Uh, Bandcamp. Band not get cup. Yeah. I'll give you yeah. the link. It's Bandcamp. I have oh, a Bandcamp. Yeah. And you'll see the, 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 the uh, part one of the soundtrack nice. being released uh, before the videos uh, later on this summer. Nice. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for hanging out with me on this show. And everybody, go check out Leo's stuff. As you can tell, he cares deeply about artistry and art in general. Uh, and I really enjoy talking to him. But that is it for today's show. Don't forget to subscribe to the Story Geeks podcast on your preferred podcast provider or even over on the Art of Storytelling, the Story Geeks YouTube channel, which if you watch us live, you already are probably subscribed there. Um, in two weeks, uh, we will be on this YouTube channel. We will be doing our next show, 
Um, I believe our next show is is on Up, but don't quote me on that because I don't have the schedule in front of me. It's either on Up or it's on The Matrix or some other great opening scene that you should definitely show up and listen to. Uh, a week after that, it will be on the podcast feed. So the, the schedule basically is we record on YouTube live. A week later, it goes up to the podcast feed, and that cycle just keeps repeating itself repeating itself um so i hope you join us for the one that's coming up in a couple weeks definitely check out the story geeks facebook group and get notified about all of our upcoming shows and finally as always special thanks to our monthly patreon supporters here are the awesome supporters who support our nonprofit through patreon the nonprofit produces this show so if you support us through patreon you produce you you support the production of this show zach linton the no midnight podcast sean r reed uh anthony holder Ray DeLeon, Brianna, Bryce Cox, Young Money Savvy, Adam Vargas, Mary Baldwin, Wade Johnson, Jim Baldwin, Kimberly Lujo, Monty Thigpen, Nick Prokop, and Connie Moe. Please consider supporting us, even if it's only for a couple dollars a month. Learn more at storygeeks.com. And until next time, question everything in your favorite stories and always seek the truth. See you guys later.